The following podcast uses words that lawyers don't use in court, even though they're thinking them. Hello and welcome to episode 340 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Today, this will air on Monday, March 7th, 2022. The next registration deadline is Wednesday, March 16th, and that's for the April LSAT. So not too far off. Um, we also have the March LSAT coming right around the corner, starting later this week. By the way, on Tuesday, March 22nd, we're hoping to interview Rachel Gezersay, uh, the author of the Law Career Playbook, The Gorilla Guide to Getting a Legal Job You Actually Like. If you have any questions about the legal market or how to get a job in the legal market, send your questions to help at thinkinglsat.com before that March 22nd interview. If you haven't already joined Nathan's study group, I would. It's every other Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. You can ask Nathan anything. What is that? It's an AMA with Nathan. Yeah, every other I love week. It. It's, yep. Yeah, it's a good time. Uh, definitely come ask me anything you want to know about the LSAT or law school admissions. I'll, I will. I promise I'll give it to you straight. Yep. Cool. Today on the show, we talked a lot about scholarships. We talked about a first-generation college student who <laughs> was being roped into applying as quickly as possible from law school admissions folks, as well as um, admissions consultants, which is unfortunate, but that's troubling how it is out yeah. there. We also talked about um, Yale's need-based scholarships. <laughs> Then we got an email from Katie, who's a former demon teacher. Uh, she went to Yale, right? Where did Katie go? No, she deferred. She uh, deferred. She's still okay. maybe going to, yeah, she's like doing better things than going to Yale. <laughs> okay, well, better than Yale. Katie sent in some emails from Judy, the YouTube lawyer. And Judy, the YouTube lawyer, has a lot of things to say about why you should not go to law school. That's her main point, I think. And we talked a little bit about that and the cost of law school, as well as one of your interviewees, uh, Professor Tamanaha, wait, ta Tamanaha, Tamanaha, Tamanaha yep. yep, who's a professor, and by the way, he lives in Hawaii and surfs in the morning. I mean, that guy, he's got it, he's got it set. But anyways, yeah, what else did we talk about? Well, we had uh, a, an email speculating about chances of getting scholarships mm. off of a wait list. For Michigan. We, mm -hmm. we, seems pretty unlikely. Um, we had an email about a potential intersection between what's happening in Ukraine and LSAT study. Uh, we had a probably too long conversation, sorry, about... Um, I think ultimately we ended up talking about focus and uh, choosing what you can do something about. Yep. And then finally a question about what kind of personality it takes to become a lawyer and enjoy it. Um, Nathan has some interesting anecdotes there. Let's jump in. So this first one is from an email that you got, right? Or you talked to somebody. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, I copied and pasted our text conversation here. Um, I got a phone call last week and, I talked to um, this nice woman who is a police officer and a first generation college student, and she was looking for advice. It was, you know how it is, Ben. It's one of those, I'm taking the test in March because the deadline for the one school that I'm going to apply to is in April and I want to get it done, you know, like that, right? And so, we were scheduled for a 15 minute consultation and I ended up talking to her for an hour because it felt like somebody that I could mm -hmm. actually help. And I ended up, you know, I, I told her, well, I mean, you called me because I'm an LSAT teacher, but my business is really saving people $150,000 mm -hmm. on law school. And I want to talk to you about the whole game you're playing, whether you know it or not. And, uh, you know, long story short, she probably isn't going to take the test in March or April. She probably is going to hold off her applications, wait till next September. She's going to work harder at her LSAT. She's going to apply with a better LSAT score. 
And I think she's going to end up going to a better law school for free yeah. as a result of all that. That's what yep. we do. And the thing that really pissed me off about it is she told me that in her investigation that she had done, you know, again, remember, this is a first generation college student for first, you know, no lawyers in her family, no lawyers in her sphere doesn't have any kind of like real actual advice. And she had, she had reached out to both law schools and to law school admissions consultants. And she had been told, well, you better do it now. Otherwise you'll be too old to get a job when you graduate or, you know, employers are going to be less likely to hire you because you know, you're, you are a little bit older, so you really better. Yeah. You better get on it. You better do it now. And I, I forget exactly, but she's 28 or 29, you know, which means she's going to graduate when she's 32 yeah, or 33, no which, well, what's the difference <laughs> between those two? Nothing. You know, what are these, what are this? That's the thing that really pissed me off. It's like, what are these schools or what are these admissions consultants? Are, are they saying that they would never do that? They wouldn't admit someone who's a year older. Because if they're not saying oh, we don't admit people who are 30, mm -hmm. then it's super fucking shady of them to say, oh, you better apply now because otherwise it's going to be really hard for you to get a job. I mean, what? <laughs> think about what they're saying. They would be saying, I mean, if they would admit her when she's a year older, then they're saying they would admit her when she has a diminished chance of getting a job. Or, you know, if it's an admissions consultant, it's like, well, I'll take your $5,000 now to help you apply this cycle. Or, you know, but but you yeah. better do it now because otherwise it's going to hurt your job prospects. Okay, well, is that same person really turning yeah. this lady down yeah. a year from now yeah. if she was a year older? Fuck no, no she's not. Of course not. they're not. <laughs> anyway, uh, you just got to be really careful who you're getting your advice from out there. You know... Uh, like we're going to save her a lifetime of debt if she takes our advice. I've already seen her. She's been in two of my LSAT classes. She came to mm. my classes last week. I talked to her on Tuesday. She came to my class on Tuesday and then came to my class again yep. on, th on Thursday. I saw her logic games diagrams that she did on Tuesday. And I saw her logic games diagrams that she yeah. did on Thursday. On Tuesday, she had no fucking clue mm. what she was doing. And on Thursday, she had come up with, she, she had done it before class, and, but she had come up with a dramatically more sophisticated approach to one of the hardest logic games you're ever going to see. I mean, it was like a game four from prep test 35 or whatever, and it was like a yeah. pretty nasty game. And she had done this like really very sophisticated, I mean, she had no idea that mm. how good it was. She, she didn't know. She was like... Well, it took me 43 minutes, and I, but mm -hmm. I got them all right. And I'm looking at the page, and I'm like, fuck, you filled up a page with, like, correct analysis yeah. of this game. You grinded it out. You figured out all the questions. You, you have no idea how much you're actually yeah. winning. Yeah. You're killing it. Like, that's so good. You're doing awesome. Like, just do that for another. Now, it might take two, three, four months. But if, but like, you're going to improve your logic game score by 15 yeah. questions and you're going to improve your LSAT by 20 yeah. points eventually. And the world's best admissions consultant, you know, they're going to like help you create a good, as good of an application as you can create with a shitty LSAT What score. are they going to do? Help you craft better sentences? I mean, that's, that's what they do. <laughs> that's literally what they do. <laughs> and, and that's, and it's like, yeah, but in the index calculation that the school is going to do, I mean, the truth is your LSAT is bringing yep. down their median. And so even if they admit you, you're not going to get a scholarship. Not to mention the fact that she was about to blunder into applying at a time in the cycle where people really don't get scholarships. I just feel like, you know, I, the law schools, they are in the business of taking yep. your money for tuition. And I feel like the admissions consultants seem to be complicit in that. They're just like happy to, 
oh yeah, no, oh yeah, you're, yo, know, you are, oh, yeah. 28, 29. Yeah, you should, you should get moving. Yeah, we need yep. to, we and, need to you do You know, this I have now. a couple other slots available this cycle, but they're probably going to be going pretty soon too, so. <laughs> <laughs> just straight up lies yeah. artificial scarcity pretending like yeah. you have limited slots yeah i mean i don't know I, you need to ask yourself whether the people you're talking to have interests that are aligned yep. with yours you know and i think i think we do i think we have interests that are aligned to with the extent that people should and want to go to law school i i really i am extraordinarily well, <laughs> disgusted by the legal profession. So there is a part of me that like, <laughs> you know, wonders about those people who end up working with us. Cause I'm like, <laughs> that's how you know that we're, that we're telling the truth though. Right. Like we're the guys who are like, yeah, law school sucks. Uh, mm -hmm. we hated it. Um, we don't think it's for everybody. I, I, if there's anything else you can do with your life, I think you should. Yeah. You know, um, and if you're going to go down this road, because I know successful mm -hmm. lawyers as well, but if you are going to go down that road, I strongly encourage you to know what you're getting yourself into and also just don't pay for it because the nature of the game is such that you don't yeah. have to pay. I, I, the law schools and the admissions consultants don't understand that you can improve your LSAT by 20 fucking mm -hmm. points. Like, and it transforms your, it transforms your scholar. It, it, like they just, again, I've said this a thousand times, but I have to keep saying it. There's a school out yeah. there right now that won't admit you with your current LSAT. That same school will give you a full ride if you improve your LSAT by 10 yeah. or 15 points. And that's true at every level. I mean, unless you're already scoring 175. Yeah. But if you're scoring 165 or 155 or 145, then there are schools that right now won't admit you, but that exact same school will give you a full ride if you get 10 or 15 more yeah. LSAT points. And that's facts that we've drawn from public data. If you want to check out those numbers, you can go to lsatdemon.com slash scholarships and play around with our scholarship estimator. I mean, there are 200 schools out there bidding for your services if you have yeah. the right LSAT and it might take a little bit longer, you know, you might have to put off your grand career plans by a year or whatever, but you know, the, the alternative blundering into this path where, where you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. And it's very easy to accumulate like instant, instant Ugh. lifetime of debt. Ugh. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> it's super hard to buy a house. It's super fucking hard to like get a mortgage. The bankers are like really concerned. Like the bankers, they don't yeah. want to give you that loan. It's like hard these days to get a loan to buy a house. It's real easy to spend that same amount of money on a JD that won't be worth well, shit. Well, that's the thing. That's so crazy. I mean, your analogy, like when you're buying a house, <laughs> If shit hits the fan, you still have that asset that you can turn around and sell <laughs> that in pres presumably well, might have even have... gone up in value. But even if it drops, it still <laughs> has value close well, to the loan. You have right? a roof. You, yeah. you have a roof over your head. You have a place where you can mm -hmm. shelter yourself from the cold. You can live inside of a house. And it, you know, even if it like plummets in value on the market, you can still live there. You're not mm -hmm. going to be homeless, but a JD, that's not going to provide you much shelter. Hey, I, as you were talking, I wanted to um, follow up on an idea that I had <laughs> this week in okay. my head while I was listening to some audiobook. Um, I wanted to figure out, we always talk about LSAT scores, right? So for example, just now you were talking about, look, if you go up 15 points, you're going from a school that wouldn't admit you to now a school that's going to offer you a full ride. Happens all the time. Same school. The same yep. school. So yes. I'm just saying, okay, let's take an applicant who's scoring around 150, bumps their score up to a 165. So 
Um, they're going up 15 points, going from schools that won't accept them to schools that will now give them full rides. Um, I, yeah. I, what I wanted to know, and this is what I was looking up while you were talking, is how many raw score points is that? Right, like we always talk about LSAT scores, but like, okay, how many points on the page are we talking about here? And this is a uh, the score scale from the May 2020 exam. But and and by the way, the exams today are out of about 75, 77 points, depending on the test. But anyways, can I guess? Yeah, go for it. it so there, it's probably like roughly one to one, like one question is one more point. It's close. Since there's fewer questions now. Each question is worth probably closer to one point, depending where you are on the scale, of course, right? Yeah. Like if you're already at 170, then one question might be worth two points. But if you're in the middle of the scale, it used to be like two questions per LSAT point, two questions per LSAT point in the middle of the scale. But now with fewer questions, it's probably more like, one closer to closer to one closer to one to one it's a little higher than that at least moving from the middle to the upper range here so going from to get a 150 on the may 2020 exam for example you would have had to get 40 questions correct out of the 76 that were available (laughs) um to get a 165 you'd have to get 62 correct out of the so 22 questions for 15 22 questions but so you divide, yeah. right? You divide that by three. That's seven questions a section. That's all we're talking yeah. about. Just getting seven yeah. more questions correct. Well, so a couple yeah. things. It's also seven easy questions. Oh, absolutely. You don't need to get the hardest ones correct. <laughs> you don't need to get the hardest ones. Yeah, you know, definitely no. not. To get to 165, no. you do not need the hard, you don't need any hard questions to get 165. What, like, let's be clear. If you're getting a 150, that's 40 out of 75. You're missing so many easy questions. Yeah. I mean, you're you're actually understanding very little on the test. It, it, it's your 150 is a bad. I mean, okay, don't get me wrong. Starting 150 or you've taken some other shitty prep class 150 that's not that bad of a, that's actually, or even starting in the one forties is fine. We're, we're yeah. No, yeah. Starting in the one forties is fine. But if you've been at it for a while and you're still getting one fifty, I have to, I have to like sort of wake you up a little, like, you know, shake you a little mm-hmm. bit, wake you mm-hmm. up to tell you, you don't fucking understand what you're reading. Yeah. <laughs> you're just not, you like, you are not reading carefully enough. You are missing a lot of easy questions. Mm-hmm. You're leaving easy points on the table because you're you're just not behaving like a lawyer. You're not reading it carefully. You're not figuring it out. It makes more sense than that. And I mean all this as a I mean all this as encouragement. Yeah. Believe it or not, I'm trying I'm trying to I'm trying to wake you up to the possibility that this test is easier than you think it is if you are more careful than you have been. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, I, you can miraculously go from 150 to 165 by like trying harder, Tr- trying differently, to, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how people are trying right now, but you just have to make sure you understand it, right? That you can't let questions go, especially the earlier questions in the section. Yeah, I mean... Right. So, okay. So what did you say? What was the number again? Was, uh, 60? 60? 60. So to go from a 150 to a 165 LSAT score, you have to go from 40 raw score points to 62 raw score points. So that's 22 points. 22 raw, scoop, raw score points, <laughs> raw score points to get 15 more <laughs> LSAT points. Okay. So it's like 20 per section that you need to get a 165. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You've got... You've got to calmly, carefully run the table at the beginning of each section. Yep. The easiest way to get there is to practice the logic games until you're perfect. The games are just, it's like so easy to improve on the games if you're studying in the right way, if you're thinking about it the right way. You can go from the single digits up to perfection on the logic games. You can end up with 23 points every single time on the logic games. Mm -hmm. And you know, so then you really only need 39 from the other two sections combined 
So 19 and a half per section on LR and RC, if you're able to perfect your games. And 19 and a half on LR and RC, yeah. I mean, shit, you could do three passages on reading comp and still get 20 points. I mean, but even and if on, you don't perfect your games, right? That's 21 questions a section. Um, <laughs> yeah, close to perfect on the game. Think about it. You can give up. You can give up. You can plan to not answer four or five questions. On all of the sections yeah. and still score one. Like everybody's talking yeah. about finishing. Yeah. Like stop talking about finishing. Yeah, I'm, right. I mean, a nine-year-old can finish and miss them all. Yeah. Like that's not hard. That's, you know, that's not actually understanding. But that's what you're doing if you're scoring a 145 or 150. You're, you know, you, you think you're doing it, but you're not really doing it because you're just not, you're not solving the questions. When we go back and look at your mistakes, I guarantee you're going to be like, oh yeah, I misread that one. Yeah. And I, you know, then I have to go, well, wait a minute. Did you misread the wrong answer you chose? Okay. But what about the right answer you didn't choose? Did you misread that too? Mm -hmm. Maybe you misread the question itself. Maybe you misread the passage. <laughs> like yeah. you maybe you misread a lot of things. Yeah. You know, it there it's really not a test of second bests. It's not like you should frequently have you know, we I get uh, boy, I had one yesterday where I uh, this poor girl who's been in our classes for quite a while and I I just I can see how hard she's struggling at it, but she, you know, she sends, she sends in an ask button request. That's like, well, I was going between C and D on this one. And that's already like, when I read that, I go, uh, you, that shouldn't be happening as often as it is. Yeah. <laughs> you're, 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 I, I can already tell when you say I was going back and forth between C and D, I'm like, well, okay, that's not how you should be doing this test because there's, I guarantee that one of those is just objectively wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're like giving it serious consideration because you just didn't read it carefully enough. You didn't read the argument carefully enough. You didn't read the question carefully <laughs> enough. You, you should have recognized how bad that answer is. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, um, Yeah, she just like her her whole understanding of the she she this one student that I'm thinking of she hasn't she has not accepted that that there is something there to be understood. Hmm. You know what I, like I don't know there's there's that student who I mean cuz she's like just perpetually stuck in the 140s. Hmm. And it's, it's like you, you, I don't think she's felt the click of, oh, wait, so that's what they're asking. Oh, so that's the, the obvious answer. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> like maybe, maybe what you're describing, I think, um, is something along the lines of the person is is answering the question. They're getting stuck between two or three or whatever. And when they read the explanation or they talk to you or talk to one of our teachers, they're almost like nodding. Like they, they almost like accept the answer because other people are saying that's the answer. And yeah. then feeling as if like they understand it. They're like, oh, okay, yeah. It's like... No, you need to get to a point where you're like, no, I, I still, sorry, I still don't understand why that's correct. And um, I want to keep digging until I can turn around and explain it to somebody else. Be like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Here's why this is better. Yeah. You know, you need to go into to the demon drilling and you need to get a whole bunch of them in a row right. Mm -hmm. You need to work on our new... By the way, congratulations on the new uh, drilling accuracy scoreboard. Oh, 
that's an awesome feature. I was showing it off into to my class on Thursday night, and everybody thought it was super cool. Uh, obviously, we'll continue to iterate on that and come up with new ways of doing it. Yeah. But for now, I mean, it's already badass. It's like so cool that you can be on a leaderboard based on your accuracy mm -hmm. on questions drilled in the the demon, and you know you need to be able to do that. Like you need to be able to get a whole bunch of them in a row, right by yourself. Yeah. And I think our students sometimes fall into the trap of relying too much on our help, relying too much on our explanations, which are good and are going to explain it to mm -hmm. you. But if you do like 10% too much volume, or if you do it 10% too fast, you know, it's like, Oh, I narrowed it down to a 50, 50 and I got it right next. Yeah. Oh, I narrowed it down to a 50, 50 and I got it right next. I narrowed it down to a 50, 50 and I got it wrong. Let me real quick. Read the explanation. No, 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 B, D. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Next. Yeah. It's like you didn't actually understand any of mm -hmm. those. I would much prefer that you just did one of them, but, but like really got there to where you, cause you know, for real, if you're not seeing how easy the easy questions are, and if you're not seeing how easy the medium difficulty questions yeah. are, which is the majority of all the questions on the test, mm -hmm. right? Like, what do we think there are in a section? Two hard questions? Hmm. Yeah. I mean... Four or five, maybe. Yeah. Not more than that. We can easily see, actually. If, if you're not seeing how easy the easy and medium questions are, then you're really not ever going to reach your true potential. Um, yeah. Go uh, I'm looking at like test 89, for example, right? And I'm looking at um, logical reasoning. And there is one, two, three, four, five, actually, this quiz is five level five questions in this section. Okay. That's level five is means that those were the ones that were missed by more students. But wait a second. Isn't this kind of like circular reasoning? Aren't, aren't we didn't you define level five by that's the 20% hardest questions would be my guess. Um, if we've got five star. Ratings. Yeah, actually. So that is something that we're, we're working on. In fact, um, okay. Some of these numbers came from LSEC itself. Oh, right. right. Um, in their super prep book, they had some difficulty ratings and I'm not sure how those are distributed. Uh, we need to look at that a little bit more, but it's not, it's actually not uh 2020. 20, 20. There are okay. more levels right. three than any of them, but. Okay. Yeah. I independent of the ratings that we're using in the demon. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that the, the, there's just, you know, the most students, like the majority, wide majority of students don't ever need to worry about the hardest ones. I mean, you certainly don't need to worry about, Anything that I would consider actually hard, mm -hmm. you do, that's not your business until you're already scoring 165 pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Going from one, you know, we'll go back to the original point, which is to go from 150 to 165, you need to get like seven more easy ones per section, right? Like you can't miss questions in the first 10. You really shouldn't miss very many questions in the first 15, like one, maybe. Yeah. And if you just learned to do the first 20 with accuracy, you'd already be at 165. I understand that that sounds challenging for people who are currently scoring 142. But we get emails every single week from people who made that leap, you know, in a, in the matter of a couple months. Sometimes more. But anyway, yeah, it happens. You can just dig in. Happens all the time. So if you hear somebody telling you, oh, well, people hardly, people really don't improve their LSAT on a retake. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, sure, if you don't do anything different between your takes, if you don't get the right kind of help, if you don't do the right kind of work, if you don't focus on actually understanding, then yeah, you're not going to improve. But if you do do those things, yep. not only can you improve a little bit, you can improve a lot where that bullshit law school who wants your application right now, yeah. they will be beneath you. You're like you won't even consider going to that school anymore. 
No. Because you'll have 10, 15, 20 more LSAT points and they'll be trying to give you a full ride and you'll be like, no, I have a full ride from some other better school. Yeah. That, you know, that's why they don't want you to retake the LSAT. They have no incentive to make you a better applicant. They, they want you to apply to their school only right now. Yep. And pay them. <laughs> that's how it works. What's their incentive? What's their incentive to make you a better applicant? They pretend like they have an incentive to make you a better applicant. Matter of fact, they do bullshit seminars on, you know, how to craft your best personal statement or whatever. Because they're trying to suck you in. They're trying to act like your friend. You know, act like they are consulting you on helping you to make a better application. Mm -hmm. When in fact, what they're doing is marketing to try to sell you on their law school. And they're going to say things like, you know, our deadline, our, our priority deadline isn't until May 1st. Priority. You should apply now. It's only March. And what are these people talking about? They should, that you should apply in September or not at all. That's, that's dangerous, bad advice. <laughs> yeah. According to them, it's dangerous to them because <laughs> it's bad for their business. Yeah. It's good for you because you're going to save 150 grand. Okay, I'll show you. <laughs> Speaking of scholarships, we have this next email. I guess Matt sent it in. Is this Matt is sent this Matt? in. Yeah, we got this. From, yes, this is from Matt D. Yeah. Uh, Matt Dumont. We got this from a couple other places as well, but Matt, Matt provided a little bit of speculation here. It says, um, Yale announced a major need-based scholarship program, 50 full rides per year. And then he has a link here, mm-hmm. which we'll post in our show notes a link to yale.edu and a a news story. Yale announces tuition-free scholarships for the highest need students. Matt speculates here. I wanted to see what you thought of this uh, speculation. Matt says, hey, maybe they're losing amazing candidates to places like Chicago, Penn, Columbia because of scholarship money. So this is their way to ease into scholarships still need based for almost a third of the incoming class. Yale admits, or Yale has a class of about 150 per year. Yes, yeah, so this is a third and of the so, class. Yeah, it's a significant, this is not a trivial amount of tuition free education that's going to be available at Yale. Yeah, I mean, it could be a, their way of buying quality candidates, but the thing that's still Unless I'm misunderstanding something, and I am skeptical, but um, these are need-based awards, right? So unlike scholarships where you can buy your best candidates, these are like, okay, we have have money that we're going to give you if you don't make enough money. That's, That's a different... I mean, it almost seems like that's the purpose behind these, the real purpose or should be the real purpose behind these scholarships, right? To help people who are at a disadvantage go to an, a higher education, a, a better school and um, get... One would hope, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's what these people always claim anyway. Which, which like is that's not... How they, that's what they pretend. Yes, and that's not true at every other place because at every other place... The people who can get the scholarships are the one who already have access to money, which is why they have higher grades, they have higher LSAT scores, and they've just had a stronger support system their entire lives, yeah. which make it easier for them to be in a position to get these scholarships. But when you're offering need-based scholarships, not merit-based scholarships, then you really are looking at their financial situation. Now, granted, they had to have met a certain merit to even be considered at Yale, but at the same time, I, it doesn't seem like as it's not a tool that they can easily, as easily manipulate and just favor. They're not favoring their richest. They're favoring their their poorest applicants, which I think is the whole point. So unless I'm missing something, this actually seems like a very good program to have. That was my take as well. I know that I come off like I'm a completely cynical dick, but I'm ultimately an optimist and you know the reason why i do what we do is that i i i i have a sincere hope that the system will actually change and, and i read this and i went hey look you know I, i've always thought that the that the change needs to come from the top 
I've always thought that it needs to happen at Yale, Harvard, Stanford. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the schools that need to look at the whole system and go, holy shit, we're charging poor people and brown people more than we're charging rich people and white people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is a fact because that's where the tuition scholarships have tended to go, right? Like poorer, browner people graduate law school with more debt. Yep. It's not fair. That's fucked up. That's super fucked up (laughs) and it needs to be fixed. And so I read this and I went, Oh, Yale has realized how fucked up and broken that system is. They're still going to only be admitting elite applicants. I mean, they have no shortage of elite applicants. Their, their LSAT, you know, their median GPA is like 3.9 something. And their median LSAT is 175 or whatever, you know, (laughs) these are, they have, an abundance of amazing applicants. Yeah. And it looks to me like what Yale has decided to do is not, you know, so they have for a long time not had the merit, so-called merit based scholarships that are so prevalent everywhere else. Yeah. Right. The, the top three, Harvard, Stanford, Yale have only ever offered need based scholarships, but now Yale's going to offer a significant big chunk of explicitly full rides for about a third of the class based on need. So I'm optimistically interpreting that as, oh, they've decided to put their money where their mouth, where their mouth is or the mouth of the whole system, put the money where the mouth of the whole system is Mm -hmm. and be genuinely interested in access and diversity and not ripping off poorer, less savvy, less connected applicants. Yep. The crazy thing is that um, even if they ended up charging full freight, which uh, is just astronomical, um, they're the they're one of the few schools, three maybe, that are actually worth the cost. <laughs> yeah. Like what you're paying for may actually benefit you financially in the same way, where everyone else is charging those prices but not offering you the same product. Yeah, everyone else is pretending to be this elite, you know, I mean, it, like, okay, maybe Yale is worth $70,000 a year. Maybe. I mean, I actually, don't, I, even though I just said that, I, I don't know that that's true, but yeah. it, it, well, if any right. law school is going to have a chance at being close to worth that, it's Yale, Harvard, and maybe Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. But then every other school in the game pretends as if they are that same level of elite, yeah. right? Like Georgetown is a really good example. Yeah. Georgetown is out there charging every bit as much money. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it's a bad law school, but like you don't write your ticket to immediate riches by going to Georgetown no. and borrowing 150, 250, 350 thousand dollars a year to go to Georgetown is a, is just an extremely dangerous idea. Yeah. Um, anyway, good job, Yale. Speaking of Georgetown, we got this next email from uh, Katie, our uh, dearly departed. Well, that makes it sound like she's dead. Katie's not dead. <laughs> Katie sent us this email. Our, our uh, former student, Katie, she's been a guest on the podcast, but guest on Demon Daily podcast. Uh, she is amazing and very genuinely concerned about these same issues. Yeah. She sent us this email. You want to yep. read it? Um, Nathan and Ben, this woman's videos are powerful. And then she sent us two videos to Judy, the YouTube lawyer. She would be a great guest for the podcast. I like this quote. She shares this quote from Judy, the YouTube lawyer. You also don't hear about document review. Now that's something you should ask those people who come over and try to market their law schools to you. You know, what percentage of your graduates wind up doing document review? Um, or more... That's a question that no law school will ever answer. Yeah. They'll pretend, uh, well, oh, what? Doc review. Yeah. Huh? Doc review. Uh, oh, well, I don't, we don't, mm, yeah. We, I'm sure some people do that, what? but yeah. I mean, it must be low because we don't have any data <laughs> on that. Yeah, doc review is basically, I, I can't imagine the doc review will be around for much longer too. I mean, it's AI has got to be something that will take over that. But the idea is 
you're an attorney at a big law firm, you're going through reams and reams and reams of files for your client. But no, you don't want to do that. Of course not. That would be an extraordinary waste of your time and your client's money. So instead of billing out you know, $500 an hour for you to look at reams of boring documents for that one, what, hidden, <laughs> that needle in the haystack that proves your client's innocence or whatever, you're going to have... Yep. Other attorneys who went to lower rank law schools or did not do as well in law school as you did, pay them $30 an hour to sit in a room and click through screens on their computer trying to find that needle in a haystack piece of evidence that will help your case. <laughs> and these are contract jobs. They last anywhere from like a month to like six months, sometimes a year, depending on the size of the case. But it, can you imagine going in and sitting there in front of a computer, clicking through documents looking for random pieces of evidence yeah judy judy the youtube lawyer was relaying stories from her friends who have done this work she she herself says that she has not done um doc review but, but that first video that we had i i was like oh my god it's like just sounded so she was talking about stories that you know people who are in like some basement or some like just you know overheated or underheated you know, sounded like just some warehouse mm. full of documents, oh. dusty, shitty. But then she was telling like the, sometimes they, um, it's super dehumanizing. Like they have to, they have to like get permission to go on a bathroom break or they have to, they like have to check in, check out at certain times because people are worried that, you know, the firm is worried that they're going to be like also freelancing on the side or something. So they're being like super, super, uh, just regimented monitored to make sure that they're actually doing this soulless mundane work and they're being paid nothing for it. It goes nowhere. There's no upside. There's no route out of it. It's just like, Nope, that's what you're going to be doing until, we're done with our discovery or whatever. And then you're gone. Like you're, you're not like actually part of the firm. Mm -hmm. She talked about real law firm lawyers coming in there and like barking orders, treating these doc review lawyers like second class citizens. I mean, it just sounded horrible. Uh, Judy's thesis, Judy, the YouTube lawyer, her whole thesis is, Basically, you shouldn't even go to law school. Yeah, that's her point. But I, I, <laughs> I read through a bunch of her other comments as well. Like YouTube commenters were, were talking to her going like, hey, I have this full ride scholarship. What do you think about that? And I did see Judy, the YouTube lawyer at that point going, oh, well, if you're going for free, then, you know, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. You're not burdened and, by debt, right? But you still, <laughs> yeah. you still have to know what you're getting into and want to practice law. Otherwise, there's yeah. no point. Um, anyway, check out Judy, the YouTube lawyer, you know, lest you think that Judy is just some, uh, dissatisfied, uh, cause there are many, many, many people who went to, you know, um, regional law schools who got a mountain of debt, who don't practice, who you know, maybe they couldn't pass the bar or they couldn't get a job. Um, lest you think that Judy went to Georgetown mm -hmm. Judy uh, got a job at a small firm working in Tyson's Corner out of law school. She says she was w making less than $30,000 a year living in the D.C. area. Yeah. How far does that get you, Ben? Oh, it's not going to get you very far at all. In fact, well, Tyson's Corner is just around the corner. <laughs> and yep. um, we just looked up the average median income in Fairfax County. Um, it's $120,000. So $30,000, yuck. I mean, and Tyson's itself is kind of like a, an expensive area relative to everything else around here. So I don't know where she even lives. Yeah, so <laughs> making a quarter of the median salary out of Georgetown. Yeah. She said no one ever followed her. I found this interesting. She said, well, you hear about NALP or these companies that track employment data, yeah. but nobody ever followed up with her. So nobody from Georgetown ever followed up to ask if she passed the bar. Nobody ever followed up to ask if she got a job. 
it'd be interesting to find out like how those stats are built because well you don't have Judy to survey to... everybody right to develop a true okay so they're, if they're sampling yeah then that that yeah okay fine um, but they but she... <laughs> still I mean I wasn't contacted were you contacted no, no. so I don't know what she... percentage of people they actually contacted no well she pointed out though that Georgetown did find her even after she had moved to North Carolina for whatever reasons she moved to North Carolina, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But she says that Georgetown did find her down there. Specifically, it was the alumni association of Georgetown law school oh. asking her for oh, donations. Yeah, okay. <laughs> which I bet you still get. Oh, I, I get. just got one yesterday. I, I, actually. I just got it yesterday. Came in the mail. It's yep. like, uh, it's, I it's like community building for <laughs> GW law school community building. I have not heard from Hastings career services ever not once ever did i hear from hastings career services but i heard from hastings alumni association immediately as soon as i graduated oh, i hear from them every know, year doing... it's every year you get yep. oh constantly yeah. more than yeah. that yeah no constant constant communication from the alumni association you know telling my telling me that i can make an investment it's like the most bizarre logic it's like you can invest in your own career by donating money to hastings <laughs> It's like, what now? I'm going to invest in my own career by, oh yeah, because you can fund scholarships for students in need. And it's like, what now? <laughs> you, you just, uh, you have the ability to let as many students of need go to your school as you would like. Just don't charge them the ridiculous fictional tuition that you char claim to charge. <laughs> just let them come. Yeah. What's stopping you? You've got giant in empty classrooms. Just let them come if that's what you are actually genuinely concerned about. Yeah. But that's not what you're concerned about. You're trying to get inside my wallet. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about this second video that Katie included. I took notes on it. Uh, this was th with Professor Tamanaha. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Tamanaha. So he wrote the book Failing Law Schools. He's a tenured law professor. Um, which obviously gave him the the protection to write this book. The moral authority and <laughs> tenure. <laughs> yep. But uh, anyways, here are some of the bullet points. I just put them into the agenda right now. But these are some of the bullet points that stuck out to me. So one thing he said was, yeah, he went to law school in the 80s. Tuition was $5,000 back then. Um, and I, he said that in his, his second year, uh, clerk, Ship or he went to some law firm. He earned enough money to pay for his tuition his third year. Yeah, I noticed and that. And I was like, okay, well, what's $5,000 in the 80s? Well, that's $17,000 today. No law school is anywhere close to that except for up in Canada. Um, that's just, I mean, the price is just astronomically ballooned. Uh, you know, schools are typically $60,000 a year these days as opposed to seventeen. dollars um, anyways, another thing that he pointed out is when he was writing this book, he said, look, the value of the education, and I think this is something we need to incorporate into the scholarship estimator. We talked about this a little bit with, um, professor, I can't say his last name, but, uh, Larry, um, about including employment data on the scholarship estimator, right? Because that indicates to some degree the value of the school. And the two numbers he yep. said that he looks at is one, you can just Google, We'll get this into the estimator eventually, but right now you can just Google the ABA disclosures data, and that will take you to the ABA disclosures website. And um, each school has an employment sheet. So just like we always talk about the 509, these employment sheets have various pieces of information about job prospects. And the two numbers that he said that he looks at are what, what percentage of the graduating class is getting full-time jobs? And what percentage of the graduating class uh, is working for large law firms? And he said that, that, that even if you have no interest in going to a large law firm, you can start seeing that these numbers vary significantly from school to school. And if the percentage of the class that's going to a large law firm is higher at a school, again, you may not be interested in that at all, but that doesn't matter. It's a proxy for how successful that law school is at placing people in... <laughs> actual legal jobs. Yep. I think just a slight clarification or tweak on yeah. that. 
I think you can also add federal clerkships to that, specifically federal clerkships. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I was just talking to Pushkar about this. He's going to do a, um, another demon daily episode about big law and like what your chances are at going to various schools sure. and you know, how, like the, the people who are really here for the money, yep. um, you know, what are my chances of getting the money? It's not just law firm percentage. It's also federal clerkship percentage. And that's because if you're at a, you know, like a super prestigious school, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, those types of places, sometimes their big law uh, percentage will actually be low because they send so many people into these very prestigious federal clerkships. I, I'm sure it's lower. I'm curious, though, how low it actually is. We just have to, have to just start looking at these numbers because I'm yeah. sure it's still like way better than some other schools. Oh, it's still right. No, no, no. Yeah, don't get me yeah. wrong. But I mean, I, I do think that you can add that in. Yeah. Like law for, like law firm percentage plus federal federal not state clerkship, no. federal clerkship percentage. Yeah. If you add those two things together, then that gives you a good sense of like, okay, these are the people who like those are the schools where they are they are cranking out super desirable candidates. Yep. And and, and connecting them with a with places that are gonna hire them. Um another interesting point that he made was that uh, tuition is going up. Uh, obviously, it's astronomically going up compared to the rate of inflation. But um, while a large law firm job can help you manage that debt, that's the only situation that can. So he, it's just like we've talked about this before, but people are going to law school and they have this m image in their mind that they're going to go to a big law firm. And if you did that, maybe the it wouldn't it still wouldn't be a good deal. It still would be a horrible deal, but it would be like theoretically doable. But given how many people don't do that, you're just really getting royally screwed, right? When you're paying anywhere close to full tuition. It's just anyways, depressing. But one other thing that I thought that um he talked about was he said, "Look, uh after the great recession, right?" A lot of kids went into law school because the economy was suffering. So they're like, okay, I'm going to avoid working for now and I'm going to go into law school. And the number of applicants went up. And then when they all came out three years later, the percentage of them that got jobs was really low. <laughs> he wrote this book. There were some changes. First of all, I mean, the employment data was being reported incorrectly. We've talked about this before, but just to recap, the the law schools were manipulating those statistics, right? The employment statistics. So people thought that their chances of getting a job were better than they actually were. His book was one of the reasons why some of those things were changed. Uh, there were other things that obviously people were complaining about. But um, anyways, he said that what happened after that was the data started getting reported more accurately. And over time, the percentage of graduates who were getting jobs went up. So it's like, hey, look, things are good. And he's like, wait, wait, hold on. I don't, he, he says, the number, <laughs> the number of, per, the percentage of graduates who are getting jobs went up, but that's not because the number of jobs actually went up. It's because the number of graduates dropped. But the number, the actual number of jobs are the same out there. And he's like, now the applicants are going back up again. He predicts in three years, you're going to have the same problem. So this was in 2021. So two years from now, you're going to get more graduates, same number of jobs. So now you're going to have a smaller percentage of those graduates actually getting jobs. Anyways, um, it sounds like a, just a typical LSAT problem. But of course, everybody manipulates this to their, to their ends, right? Law schools are like, yay, look at graduates are getting jobs in higher percentages. It's like, yeah, you just have fewer graduates. Yeah. And let's see where we're at two, three years from now. I mean... They pretend like there's some shortage of lawyers. They, they pretend like we need more lawyers. Yeah. When, in fact, you know, when we have a recession, the frequently the f first people to go, you know, it, it's like those big firms, like deals stop getting done. And we saw in 2008, we saw giant firms laying off first year associates, second year associates, third year associates. And then what do you do five years from now when it starts to pick back up? 
now there's this huge glut of experienced lawyers that you have to compete with. So hiding out in law school during a recession is not a good plan. No, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I don't know. Are we? Do we have a recession coming? <laughs> do we? <laughs> well, Fed's about to jack up interest rates, yeah. right? To uh, to prevent inflation. Um, and when the Fed jacks up interest rates to prevent inflation, they have never been able to do that without inducing a recession. <laughs> so <laughs> the odds of a recession, I mean, I, I don't even try to prognosticate the economy, but it's, um, yeah, there, there is risk looming. Uh, we have actual inflation. Yeah. We have the Fed saying that they are going to act. And every time that's happened in the past, there's been a recession. So what do you think? Yeah. I mean, meanwhile, there's a shortage of nurses. There's a shortage of basically everyone in medical, in, in any kind of medical field. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of other careers out there that you could pursue that are cheaper to get yourself into, both in terms of time and money, and have a much more reliable, um, you know, uh, prognosis. Is that the right word? Uh, for prospect at least. Um, yeah. Define prognosis. Does it always have the likely course of a disease or ailment uh, or no, a forecast of the likely outcome of a situation? I could say prognosis, I think. Um, there are, there are so many careers that just have like an obvious, there's a, you're feeding, you're filling an obvious need in the marketplace. Yeah. I got a buddy right now who is doing the Google data analytics certificate. Okay. It's like a six month program. You have to pay like $80 a month for a Coursera subscription. Okay. Yep. Google itself. Google certifies you in data analytics mm -hmm. and they teach you, you know, what you need to know about SQL, a little bit of R programming, a little bit of, um, what did he say? He said, I, I checked in with him last night to ask how it's going. And he said, uh, we're learning Tableau and design type stuff, which is a nice change of pace. I can make shit pretty now. Hmm. So he's, you know, he's working on this six month certificate that when he's done with it, <laughs> I was looking at the website for it last night and it was like, you can apply directly for jobs at Google with this certificate or any number of hundreds of other employers that want people who are trained in these skills. And what do you think they're getting paid? Maybe 50,000, well, 60? No, it was like 69 eight or something like that. It was roughly $70,000 is like the average salary. Yeah. That's crazy. Of people who have this certification. Yeah. I mean, six months of your life, $80 a month and then boom, you're getting a job that's paying more than a lot of law applicants who just are wasting money and time three years and just boring shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't imagine that Google Analytics is extraordinarily exciting, but is it any worse? It can't be any worse. It's not worse than doc review, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, my take on it is you would be doing actual useful projects. Like you would be, you know, you would be taking information like raw data yeah. and you would be discovering things within the data and knowing how to present that data in a way that you can tell a story that you might be able to actually get something done with it. Sure. You're moving the world forward as opposed to mitigate or mediating between disputing parties. I mean, there's still a place yeah, for fighting that. over money. Yeah. Still a place for that. You know, it's a small place. Well, anyway, so thanks Katie for <laughs> <laughs> writing in and sharing those those two people, I think, uh, yeah, we'll maybe try to interview at least one of them. Right. So love to get Judy, the YouTube lawyer on the show. Love to get professor Brian Tamanaha on the show. Um, we'll work on those and see if we can 
see if we can talk to these folks because they are certainly doing work that we respect and uh, they seem to be speaking the truth. These are uncomfortable truths that people don't want to hear. Um, but, you know, I, I personally could never, I can't stop talking about it because I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I, there's, I don't see, I don't, to me, it seems unconscionable that you would be out there just like selling law school as if it was this unequivocal good, you know, like yeah. people should be proud to go to law school. You'd be, you'd be so lucky and it's going to, you're going to, you're going to change your you know, you're going to, boy, this is going to be such a positive step for your family. Uh, watch a couple of these Judy, the YouTube lawyer videos and see if you, she, I mean, she's out there like advocating on behalf of her, what she feels is like her Asian American communities. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, she's like out there. It's like, please don't go to law school. This will be bad for your family. This will be bad for your future. Yep. <laughs> so, um, just make sure you're getting all sides of the story, not just what the law schools are trying to sell you. Yeah. All right. This next one's from L. You got it? Sure. Hi, is there any possibility of receiving admission scholarships if the school accepts an application off the wait list? I have been waitlisted by a REACH school and assume it is not worth my time to fill out their waitlist survey. Dude, how valuable is your time, L? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ben, yeah. I mean, that's a very not lawyer thing to say. Wait a minute. It's not worth your time to fill out some document. It's not worth your time to create some document and send it in. That's not worth your time. I don't know. I mean, what you, I, I agree. Your chances of success or getting a going to the school for free seem low to me. But what it's going to take you thirty minutes? How how long can this be? How long did it take you to fill out, to send us this email and now wait for a response? You could have been done with this survey weeks ago. Yeah, people like you know people want an excuse to be lazy. I mean, I yeah, I agree. I. I I'm pretty much of the opinion that the second you get like waitlist equals denial. Yeah. I mean, many get actually, as far as I know, in most cases, when you get on a waitlist, that's the last you're ever going to hear from that school. Sure. The Cause they'll, they literally keep you on the waitlist until school starts and then just don't ever tell you that you didn't get in. <laughs> that happens in a lot of cases. Yep. So waitlist equals. Yeah. No, nah, sorry. L acknowledges that this was a reach school. You're not going to get a scholarship at a reach school anyway, but you're especially not going to get a scholarship at a reach school off the wait list. I mean, what they're telling you is your numbers aren't good enough. So I, I mean, um, I guess the bottom line here is maybe it's not worth L's time, but at the same time, I just like, I don't know. You're applying to schools. Why did you apply? <laughs> that took way longer than this. Final survey. I would at least see what they have to offer. I agree. I, yeah, you have gone that far. I can't imagine not telling them that you're still interested and in filling. I mean, if you don't fill out that thing, you're denied. Yep. If you don't fill out that thing, you're not in. If you do fill out that thing, they might admit you. I definitely don't think Dean Z is about to cut you a check. Mm -hmm. I mean... Okay, so, you know, to continue, for context, L says, I have a 3.93 GPA, a 166 LSAT, and have worked for the state's public defender for three years, which is neither here nor there. This was an application for Michigan law. Oh, Michigan. Okay. That's Dean Z. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we can go inside Dean Z's office. We know what Dean Z is thinking. Dean Z looks at that application and goes 3.93. I like that. That raises my median. Ugpa. <laughs> that raises my median Ugpa. Yeah. She says Ugpa. <laughs> that raises my median undergraduate GPA. 3.93 is better than my 50th percentile median GPA, which is 3.84. So, and, and she likes that for two reasons. One, it's a good indicator of how likely you are to succeed in law school. Two, 
it makes you it makes her school look more prestigious to the rankings agencies. So there's two separate reasons why she likes L's 3.93 undergraduate GPA. But L is also applying with a 166 LSAT. Yep, and that's the 25th percentile for Michigan. It's five points lower than her median. Yeah. It's at her 25th percentile. And so Dean Z explicitly has said she does not like that for two reasons. LSAT is a good predictor of your likely success in law school. So she is worried about your ability to do the work. Two, it lowers her median on this document that I'm looking at right now. This is the ABA standard 509 information report for University of Michigan. Just go to lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. We've got links to all of these 509 reports. But she's like, well, I'm worried. Your 166 indicates that you might not have what it takes to cut it here. And you're going to make my school look bad to the world. You're going to make my school look bad to the rankings agencies. And I'm going to lose money because of that. I'm going to get fewer applicants. And I'm going to lose. Yeah. Yeah, I need more applicants. I need more I, I need more great candidates to choose from. I want everybody applying to Michigan. And if I admitted you, I'm gonna make my school on the public data look less prestigious. You know, Michigan is giving um boy, it says ninety nine percent of their students get some form of a grant. Uh Less than half tuition, though, to 63% of those thousand students that are at the school. At that point, I feel like I actually feel like he'll pro if he gets in, he'll probably get some money, some scammership. It's right. It's going to be some some trivial money. I mean, what their 25th percentile grant is seventeen thousand dollars, and that's on a tuition of. Yeah, sixty-four thousand dollars. So you know, like she, what'll happen if she if she does let you in? So this is now I'm gonna speculate. Fill out the survey and see if I'm right, L. If she admits you, she's gonna offer you fifteen thousand dollars a year, which means that she's still gonna charge you forty something thousand dollars to go there. Yep. And by the way, that's consistent with the estimator, which is predicting less than half, zero to thirty-four thousand. Um, by the way, I side note here. Okay. So there's a total of one, th at least in 2020 to 2021, that, that school year, there were 1,013 students, 1,001 of them got grants. <laughs> so I want to know if you're one of those 12 people who paid full freight at Georgetown. Ugh. yeah, really amazing. That's like, why not just like throw... <laughs> thousand bucks to each of them right so now everybody can say oh i got a scholarship it's sad yeah yeah uh yeah do do not pay <laughs> do don't pay for law school you know at this meanwhile at the same school a solid 33 percent are getting half to full, half to full. Mm -hmm. another another couple percent that are listed here as more than full so 35 percent of the class that's getting half or more of that tuition covered and you know you want boy you want at least half you you really you want a full tuition scholarship yeah. to go to law school because you could get it somewhere else if you don't get it from dean z but I, is she going to give it to you off the wait list probably not is she going to give it to you when you have a 25th percentile lsat no what's our overall best advice for l take the lsat again Hell yeah. 166? You've got to... See, people do a stupid analysis. It's it's human nature, but people go, oh, I have really good grades. So, you know, 3.93 and a 166. And and they like they want to just like let their grades carry them. Yeah. But if you change that, well, how, 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 what's it going to take there to make Dean Z salivate? <laughs> Probably a 171. That's her median. Yeah. Five right? points. So five more points. Yep. And all of a sudden, Dean Z is like, oh, well, your LSAT and your GPA indicate that you can do the work. 
your LSAT at my median, it's not gonna lower my median. It's not gonna raise my median. Be great if it was a 172 instead, but still 171, I admit plenty of people with 171s and your 3.93 makes me look good. Yeah. Let me give you a scholarship. And yeah, you're, you're, uh, uh, she's not waitlisting you in that case. Okay. Shout out Dean Z. Yeah. We, we love Dean Z. We want her on the podcast. She's, she seems like she's an admissions person who is like shooting pretty straight. Pretty um, straight. <laughs> pretty. <laughs> well, we'll yeah. See. She comes on the show. We would, we'd like be able to actually talk to her. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Al. You want to read this next yeah, one? Yeah, this is from Don. Good day to the LSAT Demon team. You can use my name if you want. All right, thanks. What are your thoughts on LSAT studying the most salient solution situation? What? Sorry, what are your thoughts on LSAT study and the most salient situation that's happening in Ukraine right now? Salient. So like standing out. I just looked it up. Stand out, right? Salient is like most prominent. That's my guess. What is it? Yeah, salient. As an adjective, most noticeable or important. So an example would be if you cover all the salient points of the case. I feel like it means relevant, but here it has synonyms important, main, principal, major, chief. So primary, notable. Don, I'm I'm not loving the most salient. It seems like you are salient. <laughs> I just didn't love the adjective to begin with. I mean, like, why are you telling me that Ukraine is salient? Salient to what? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, I just don't see how it's salient to LSAT study at all. If salient means relevant or important or primary principle, Ukraine is not the LSAT. <laughs> what are your thoughts on LSAT study and. The, the, One of the least salient things I can bring up right now, which is Ukraine. <laughs> or what else? A traffic well, I mean, jam not, in like <laughs> your nearby right. town? Like, yeah, I don't. Global warming. Yep. Homelessness. Um, traffic, noise pollution. Uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean,. Look, what's ha tragedies happening everywhere all the time? Yeah, like, and what's happening what are in you Ukraine sucks. It's really yeah. shitty, and Putin is a bully, and he needs to be stopped somehow, shape in some way, shape, or form. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that. I'm not a political savant, so it it struck me as like I. I, I, I feel you like, okay, you want to be passionate about Ukraine? Great. I don't see what it has to do with LSAT at all. But it, you want to read the rest sure. of this email? I'm trying to find common ground between focusing on the LSAT and caring for what's happening in the world right now. Common ground? You want to find a connection between the two, okay? I'm taking this... A, a t I'm taking this as maybe a teaching experience for practicing my focus amidst distractions out of my control. Okay. Are there other opportunities in this experience apart from practicing focus that I can work on that's related to the LSAT? Thank you for your time. And I hope you'll entertain the you'll entertain discussion from this wishing peace in the world. Um, I mean, some good news, by the way, Despite the conflict that's happening in Ukraine, uh, peace in the world has dramatically increased over the past thousands of years. <laughs> Thank God we were born now and not even just 500 years ago or 100 years ago. Typical punishment was to just hang people in the streets. Yeah, you did something we don't like, whoo, they killed you. So I'm not trying to minimize what's happening in Ukraine, but the world is a lot safer and more peaceful now and so maybe these things seem bigger than they are on some level or they're more they more dramatic to people yeah because people have too much news i mean we have access to like too much news 
It's, it, I don't know. My opinion is national, like my opinion, world news and world politics and national politics even is just, it's ineffectual to spend time focusing on it. I don't, I, you're not doing anything about it. Sure. Like if you want to do something about Ukraine, then you're talking to the wrong guy. Cause I don't know what to do about Ukraine. I like <laughs> go, go to Ukraine. Probably got go get on a fucking airplane. <laughs> I mean, it ain't, it's <laughs> like, I just don't know. Like focusing on it. Right. Like, perseverating on it, worrying about it, follow closely following every step of it in the news. That to me just seems really, it seems really, while I, while it is clearly miss, while it is clearly well-meaning, it seems also obviously ineffectual. Yeah. I just don't think we're doing anything by following all of these headlines and feeling all worried about them. Like, it seems to me what's happening is Don is reducing his own capacity to actually improve his LSAT, which apparently is a goal of his. Yeah. Like, I don't see common ground between... He, he, so he's looking for common, he's like, it's almost like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth, right? Because he's looking for common ground between focusing on the LSAT and carrying what's happening in the world right now, while also trying to experience practicing focus amid distractions out of his control. Well, which is it? <laughs> well, are, do you, because ain't no, there's no answer like, oh, you can actually improve your LSAT score by protesting the invasion of Ukraine. Like that's not that, that it's almost like that's what he is hoping we're going to say here. If I, I'm just not understanding at all what he's saying. Yeah. Or maybe he's trying to, maybe he feels motivated to do something about Ukraine and he also wants to study for the LSAT. So he's hoping that there is a link between the two. Like, oh, if you study for the LSAT, that's going to make, that's going to somehow help Ukraine. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And so then he can feel good about spending time studying for the LSAT and oh. taking care of world problems. Oh. Yeah, okay. I mean, sure. Get a 175 plus to go along with your 4.0 undergraduate GPA. Go to Yale and become a world leader. Look, you don't even actually have to <laughs> to do that amazing stuff to not necessarily help Ukraine, but if you want to make the world a place, uh, the world a better place, make yourself better. Do the best you possibly can. That will make you a strong person, which will make you better able to help those around you. And to the extent you can do that is to the extent that you're going to make the world a better place. That may or may not have anything to do with Ukraine, but... I just think you've got much better chances of impacting your local community. I mean, like, run for school board, run for city council... Do do something like organize some shit in your neighborhood because you can impact the lives of the people who you actually live with in your community. There are people in your community who need help. But before you I mean, even there are, yeah. I mean, yes, but before you even worry about that, you got to <laughs> take care of yourself. I feel like so many people are like, and I don't mean that in a selfish way. I don't mean take care of yourself and don't worry about other people. I mean, no, you put the mask on. You put the yes. you put the mask on yourself yes. first before you put it on. Exactly. The baby. You 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 yes. are incapable of doing anything of significance until you can elevate your own capacity to work. <laughs> for example, like figure out a way to conquer this test. Well, that's that is now going to help you get a higher score, but it's also going to help you just be a harder worker. And then you, whatever you decide to do down the road, you'll be in a 
better position to actually do it as opposed to just, as you said, perseverate about it. I, I think you need, you're right. And to do that, it sounds to me like Don is someone who needs to delete Twitter off his phone. Yep. He needs stop to stop checking scrolling. The news. Yeah. He's doom scrolling the news. You know, I, I, I look at the, I get the New York times daily digest email and I look at it for four minutes every morning and that's it. That's my news following for the day. They will tell me what's going on. I know that there is an invasion in Ukraine. It is tragic. And I then go on with my day there. I, I'm not, I mean, whatever. I'm not like an activist. I feel like I'm a reasonably educated, a reasonably informed person. And I'm, I just know that I'm not going to fix the problem by doom scrolling about it. You know, <laughs> like it, it will. And, and I guess I'm still like irritated about the choice of salient there at the beginning of the email. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like you, you're in bringing up in that same sentence, right? In the question, you're asking about the LSAT and then you're describing Ukraine as salient. Well, that's your problem there. Like that, those, those two things are just not like you, you can, you can do one or the other. I, but I don't, I don't see how you're going to be doing both at the same time. Yep. Like multitasking is not the answer. Okay. Look, here's, here's how I would sum it all up. The world is filled with problems. Ukraine is making you acutely aware of one of millions, billions, literally maybe trillions of problems that are out there. And the best way to solve them is to make yourself more skilled, more knowledgeable, and studying for the LSAT is one way to do that. So great. There's a hundred million ways to make yourself better as a human being. And uh, crushing the LSAT could be, sounds like your way right now. So just focus on that and do the best you can. Yeah. <laughs> And I also think that there are problems closer to home that if you wanted to actually do something to impact the world, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm completely ignorant. Maybe there are meaningful things that U.S. or Canadian students could do to actually do something about the situation in Ukraine. I don't know what those would be. Maybe there are things that we could meaningfully do, but... I know that there are like tragic homeless problems in your city. And there are, I don't know, like there are probably people that could, that, that you could help a mile from your house. And I don't know, maybe we just need to like turn our attention closer to home, like turn off this. We have, it's like terror porn, you know, it's just this like global we're never going to stop hearing about the most dramatic, terrible thing that's happening on the whole planet. And I, I just don't, I, I, I fear, I guess that we get, we get distracted by these huge global tragedies that there's nothing we can do about. And then it paralyzes us from fixing problems that are in our actual backyard. Sure. Or in your I, own I house, like just take care of yourself, get yourself, get your house in order, <laughs> get your life in order so you can actually have an yeah, impact. Go make your bed. Yeah. <laughs> go, go make your bed <laughs> and do, do the dishes mm -hmm. uh, and like, yeah, be the best you, you can be today. Yep. Probably make your bed, clean up the dishes out of the sink get yourself a quiet space to work. And then if LSAT is you know, like, if law school is your destination, I mean, that's what you probably need to be working on today. And even if your destination is to help with these global events, how are you going to effectively do that? Really? You're going to get the best LSAT score you can get. You're going to go to law school. You're just going to keep climbing, but you can't jump from one <laughs> platform to an entirely new one. You have to go step by step. What's that mean? That means focus on the LSAT today. That's your job. Other people 
are already way up there and they're doing their job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. It, it's like people, people think that they're going to be playing in global politics, you know, while they're still really struggling to get over the hump of basic understanding of the LSAT. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a put the mask on yourself first type of situation. <laughs> like you're, you're not fixing Ukraine with your 148. You, you, you need to, you need to focus on what's in front of you right now. Yeah. Like baby steps. Yep. So I think the thing that you really need to focus, like you did say, I'm trying to practice focusing amidst distractions out of my control. And I, I want to go back to my advice about deleting Twitter off your phone. If you're getting news alerts, I think you need to cancel all those. If you're doom scrolling about the invasion, I think you, I don't, I don't see how that's helping anything. I would say not only turn off those alerts, delete the app. You don't need yes, to li- you don't need app. Twitter. You yeah. don't need the news app on your phone. You don't need anything that you can then click into to find information on. No, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever it is, get rid of all of it. Because you also don't need updates from your colleague who is on some fancy vacation somewhere. You don't need that. And you don't need all the pictures that everybody's sharing around. You don't need the stupid videos and the stupid memes. You can turn off the alerts on your text messages. You can turn off the alerts on your email. You can delete the email application from your phone like I did recently. And I followed suit. (laughs) You can turn off on your Mac or your PC. You can turn off all the little pop-up alert things. Get rid of all of those. You know, stop following everything. Yeah, you're carrying a burden that you cannot control, as you said. (laughs) It's like unfollow everything, unfollow the world. Yep. If, if you're practicing your focus, if you want to, if you want to achieve a thing, then you need to eliminate all those other things. Oh, by the way, it, what, what Nathan is saying right here too, is ex- extraordinarily backed up by science. Um, it, the number one factor in whether or not you succeed with a goal is not your willpower it's your environment. So create the environment that will lead to your success. You you don't want to eat chocolate ice cream at night? Don't buy it and put it in your freezer. Yeah. yeah don't absolutely. as opposed to, well, I'm you know, I'm committed I'm committed to this and and you know, when it gets to that time, I'm going to resist it because this is so important to me. That's that's a failing strategy. The correct strategy is set up your environment so that you win. Don't rely on your future willpower, which will deplete every day. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that's an excellent bit of advice. And I would also say, uh, and I'm just kind of obsessed about it because I, I finally got around to reading, um, and finishing that book essentialism, mm. which I think you had recommended to me a long time ago, mm-hmm. but it, it's like my takeaway, my biggest takeaway from that book is to be an essentialist you need to start by basically saying no to everything. And yeah. like your default position should essentially, it should basically be no. Yeah. Because, because when you say no to anything, yep. every, every, most things, when you say no to most things, then what you're doing is you're saying yes to the essential, <laughs> the salient thing. Yeah. Right. And so that's why I think we, we all just need to say no to invitations and, uh, you know, follow me on whatever and, um, all of these attention grabbing things, right. Televisions need to be turned off. (laughs) I don't care what's on, turn it off. Just say no to it. So that you can, because you already have more than, you have too many things already on your plate. Yep. And you need to quit things and turn off things and unsubscribe from things so that you can put yourself in that environment that's going to set you up for success. How many of our students, Ben, are like, 
well, I've been studying for the LSAT for five months, and but I, you know, I struggle to. Forget, I don't. It's hard for me to find a quiet place to work. It's hard for me to find a time when I'm not being interrupted by my job. I, I've got kids, and I've got pets, and I've got roommates, and it's all these other distractions. You know, how, how do I find the time? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the challenge, and it's like you've got to just get rid of stuff. Got to say no. Yeah, no, I love that idea. Say no to everything because you're not going to say literally no to everything. What you're going to do is you're going to clear the field and then you're going to feel free to pick the things that really matter to you. Yeah. You know me as a business partner, Ben. Like you've you've seen me. I'm like a idea guy, mm-hmm. right? I'm like constantly generating all these ideas and I do have fucking good ideas. But I have too many ideas. Mm-hmm. And I end up like going off in a hundred different directions or directing our staff, our team. (laughs) They're awesome. Right. And I waste their time by pinging them in a thousand different directions all the time. But that's one thing that I've started doing lately. It's like, oh, that project is not immediately a home run. My bad. Never mind. Stop. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't do it anymore. Goodbye. I don't care how much time we've spent on it. I don't care what it has potential to whatever. Just stop. I don't want to do that yeah. anymore. Never mind. My bad. Yeah. And I need to, you know, that's going to be probably a lifelong kind of a, a battle for me is to, because, because of what I'm doing, if I do that, I'm actually saying yes to the big idea. Yeah. Right. Which maybe we're already working on, or maybe it's coming up, but my default position should be, Oh, that's a really good idea. Wow. That has a lot of potential. And I'm going to say no to it because it's going to distract me from these other, you know, the, the one big idea. Anyway. Cool. Thanks Don for writing in. Hopefully something in there was helpful. (laughs) Well, and I, I mean, I want to apologize kind of because it's like, I, I see, you know, Don, you're concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. I, I'm not like, I don't want to diminish that. I don't want to say it's not important. Um, you know, it's a tragedy that sucks. Fuck Vladimir Putin. I, you know, I don't know really what you want me to say about it. I just, um, but I, I, I do kind of think though that like if, if, if you're if you're legitimately asking me how, how do I further my legal career and LSAT, then you need to basically turn off the Ukraine news because you you've you gotta you gotta get <laughs> you gotta get focused on the one thing. Yep. Or turn off the LSAT and go focus on Ukraine. Either way, I'm not telling I'm not gonna I'm not like I'm not telling you what your priority should be. Yeah. I am telling you that you can only have one priority. Cool. Um, yeah. This next email is from B. Uh, you got it? Sure. Hi, guys. In episode 334, Nathan said, quote, legal practice sucks. You got to be the right exact special type of crazy person. Over 50% of people I talk to on a daily basis, in my opinion, should not go to law school. That's a quote from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And B says, could you say more about the personality type suited for law and the types that are not? Um, okay, I don't, I, I'm sure there's people who are better equipped to talk about this than we are, but I, I can tell you some things that are, I can tell you some things that are pretty common. So one, lawyers write. That is a reoccurring theme, right? Lawyers write, 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 and they write well and they don't make mistakes, they obsess about what they're writing and the points that they're trying to make. So if you don't like writing, law is not for you. Um, Research. Reading as well. uh, Reading, reading in preparation to write. You You have to have something to write, and that's a lot of research. A lot of times we're, we're not reading novels, we're not reading Stephen King, we're reading things that were written like contracts right? Whether it's statutes, legal opinions, whatever. So it's a lot of reading. 
It's a lot of writing. I do think though that a, a love of books generally is a is a extremely that's a very strong predictor. Like when I'm thinking, I have an archetypal lawyer in my mind, mm -hmm. and she obsessively reads for pleasure. Well, I would say that's a she necessary. She works 12 hours a day <laughs> Maybe. and gets done and obsessively reads for pleasure. So like, yeah, I would just think that's one of the, that's a, that's a good marker. Like if you're an obsessive reader and writer. Sure. I guess I was going to say, I see that as something that's necessary, but not sufficient. Right. So you get, no, no. Oh, well, I don't think anything is sufficient. Yeah. I mean, even if you have all of the good things that we're going to say, even if you have all of those, we're both going to still say, yeah, but there, if there's anything else you could do, you should probably do yeah. that instead. Yeah. So research, reading, writing, and, and, and this is all in front of a computer, right? Sitting on your butt for hours at a time. I mean, maybe you have a standing desk, but the point is, is you're in an office and that's what you're doing day in and day out. And then, you know, you, there's a different types of law. So <laughs> there are people who are divorce attorneys and they're talking to their clients and then telling them how to argue. But again, you're still drafting agreements. And so that's reading, writing and knowing the law. <laughs> yep. What would you add? Um, well, so I have an example to where I think I can contrast the people who are and who are not yeah. suited for the law. In my experience and from the testimony of actual lawyers, I think that the people who are suited for the law are those who know what the work of lawyers actually looks like and want to do that. So the people who understand that law is ritualized combat using English language and you don't care so much about the underlying matter as you care about the game and being good at the game and winning the game of law. Yeah, that's actually a good point. So it's the process that you enjoy more than the outcome. Because if you're obsessed with the outcome, right? How many people are like, oh, I'm so worried about kids in foster care. So I want to go into law and help them. Well, then you're concerned about the outcome, which can give you motivation. But boy, you're going to be frustrated with the way in which you have to achieve those outcomes. No. A good fighter yeah. is someone who wants to punch other people in the nose, and is okay with getting punched in the nose, but thinks that they're going to punch the other guy in the nose faster and harder and more frequently and thereby win the fight. But you've got to want to fight. Yeah. And, um, so contrasting two immigration lawyers who I have known closely, uh, I had a close friend and colleague who went to UC Hastings who had a genuine concern for refugees and wanted to work in the refugee clinic at Hastings and wanted to go on the Hastings to Haiti program and wanted to help people like had a burning desire to help other people. And I know Cole Black who had worked in a law firm and recognized that she was good at law and didn't give any shits who she was working for, just wanted to practice law. Yeah. One of those two people, they both went to Hastings. Hmm. One of those two people is an immigration lawyer today and very successful. And one of them is not the one who cares a lot, never practiced law. Yep. Because emotionally it was too hard for her. She also cared too much for all the other people in her life. She wanted to spend time and do things for them. Yeah. And therefore she was not capable of the single minded type of focus that it was going to take to actually do good legal work on behalf of her clients. Yeah. The amount that you care about the outcome for that client, it doesn't matter if you don't care about winning the 
case, yeah. right? So I just had this conversation with Cole Black and she was like, she's like, the truth is I don't care about my client. Like I don't, she's like, I don't care about my client like personally, yeah. but I care about their case and she never fucking loses yeah. because she cares about the case. She's like, I care about it for me. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I want to win for me. Yeah. And because of that, she's an amazing attorney. Yeah. Like she doesn't lose that fight, but she doesn't really care like what team she's on or what, you know, it's like, I don't care. I just like, I'm doing legal work Yeah. and I know how to, I know how to win legal cases. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, Hey, do you want someone who's going to real? if you're hiring a lawyer, mm -hmm. do you want someone who cares a lot about you <laughs> or do you want to win? <laughs> do you care about the outcome or do you care about the feelings that you're going to have someone that can sympathize with you, but maybe not help you win. <laughs> well, do you, yeah. Do you want like a super heartfelt hug when you lose? Or do you want a super awkward high five <laughs> air high five when you won? <laughs> <laughs> which one do you want? Cause I know where you can get the losing sympathetic hug. And I also know where you can get the air high five. Like, thank you. Nice doing business with you. See you next time. Yeah. Peace. We won. Like, I know where you can get that too. And like, I don't know. I, for me, and it, it goes back to like when I met Cole at, at Hastings, I remember her saying, I thought she was super naive at the time. I've told this story before. I thought I, you know, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to do um, intellectual property law, I think. Mm, mm. <laughs> Total bullshit. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But I had this, like, here's my story. Yeah. I'm going to do, and I think you know, probably that or maybe some sort of business. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> fucking pompous, like, dumbass. I knew nothing. And and Cole, meanwhile, I, I was sitting next to her in our 1L classes. And she was like, oh, yeah, I don't care what kind of law I practice. I just want to practice law. And I remember being like, <laughs> this girl, she doesn't, <laughs> how naive she doesn't even have it. She doesn't even have like a focus of an area of practice. <laughs> These people, they're, what are they? They, they don't have, they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even, doesn't even have a, an area of law that she <laughs> intends to practice, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it, the truth is exactly 180 degrees opposite yeah. of what I thought it was as a dumbass one L. Yeah. The, the truth is I knew nothing. She knew everything because she knew what it was like to actually practice law and wanted to do that work. And she, she would have been a badass lawyer in any field. Which, which have a lot of similarities, right? Yeah. She's focused on immigration, but I mean, filing paperwork and, <laughs> writing forms and filling out documents that that can be done. She has anywhere. no interest in actual immigration. Yeah. She, she, she ended up in that field by circumstance and she's really good at it. So she stayed in that field and she works at an immigration firm, but she could be doing criminal defense. She could be doing, um, civil major civil prosecutions. She could, she could be doing anything, because, you know, she, she knows what legal work looks like because she had worked in a law firm. She knew she had an aptitude for that. She's excellent at reading and writing. She has a ridiculous work ethic. I mean, you know, can you sit there for 12 hours a day without stopping? Yeah. And, um, this insatiable desire to win, Yeah. you know, uh, I, maybe I'll just stop by saying this is the woman who told me she wanted work to be the primary focus of her life. And I think that might be the ultimate thing. Do you want work to consume your life? Do you want it to be the main focus of every day that when you get up, you immediately start working and you work until you're exhausted and you do that every single day. I think that's the thing that is <laughs> really the crazy, the, the, the special type of crazy person who is suited for law. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thanks for writing in. Be LSAT famous. Get on an upcoming show by emailing help at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, email help at lsatdemon.com. You can also check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 340 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>